Greetings. I'm Rob Samari, the Division of Cardiovascular Diseases at the Mayo Clinic. And today I'm pleased to be joined by Dr. Rajiv Gulati, one of the leading interventionalists at the Mayo Clinic, to talk about a topic that has been very exciting over the last few years, and that is the topic of renal vascular denervation. Rajiv, it seems to me like the thought of an interventionalist treating hypertension with a catheter must be the old analogy of to a man with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. <laughs> so this is a great opportunity to talk about a field that's been very exciting. Tell us how the field of renal vascular denervation was developed. Yeah, thanks, Rob. Yeah, no, this is a great uh, chance for uh, us in the cath lab to rebrand ourselves as preventative cardiologists, I think, to treat hypertension. But uh, th this is a really fascinating story. I won't go into too much detail because I think we've known for a number of years the importance of the sympathetic nervous system in hypertension. What is now becoming increasingly clear is how important the kidney is as a sensor of hypertension to modulate sympathetic nervous activity. So the data, I think, and the think thinking comes from surgical sympathectomy back in the 40s and 50s, which was the only treatment for hypertension. Worked incredibly well, but was beset by problems with orthostatic hypotension, autonomic problems because of complete sympathetic nervous transection. Um, and now there's this ability to kind of nicely modulate sympathetic activity by focusing an ablation in the renal nerves to, to, to uh, affect both sympathetic efferent uh, outflow at the kidney level and also affect afferent nervous system discharge to the brain, thereby reducing chronic sympathetic overactivation. So was it technology that drove the opportunity or was it unmet need that drove the technology? I think it was more likely the former, um, this, this recognition of, uh, of, the, of the importance of the sympathetic nervous system, of sympathectomy being a really brutal way of treating hypertension, and then with the development of these ablation catheters that can focus ablation, um, so it seems more that, that the technology has enabled this to, to be um, potentially a widespread technology. So there's been a number of ongoing large-scale international clinical trials. Catch us up on where the evidence for renal denervation is in the treatment of hypertension. The evidence began with a, a single case report, then a case series, then a randomized study of, uh, um, in the Simplicity 2 study done mostly in Europe and Australia of patients who underwent denervation who were compared to historic controls who didn't undergo the procedure and it showed a clear reduction, sustained reduction in, in blood pressure in those treated with denervation, around about 30 millimeters systolic and 12 diastolic, that's now sustained out to two years. The criticism of that study was this was not a sham control procedure, so of course there's the potential for, for, for effects due to lifestyle changes in those who were treated. The Simplicity 3 study, which has just finished recruiting in the US, addressed that. It was a much larger study, 530 or so patients randomized, two to one, to denervation versus sham. And these are patients with resistant hypertension as evidenced by? Yeah, resistant hypertension with a systolic of 160 or more, diastolic of 90 or more, on optimal doses or maximally tolerated dose of three drugs, including a diuretic. Good going hypertension on good medical therapy. And so when will the results of that trial be available? Well, we've finished uh, recruiting now, so we're hoping to, to hear within six months maybe some of the early data. Um, Medtronic, who sponsored the trial, will have that information, but six to nine months is the projected time frame. And the primary endpoint was blood pressure control. Six-month uh, office blood pressure reduction. So we've learned from coronary vessels as well as pulmonary veins that putting energy across a vascular bed has a potential downside. What's the potential downsides of, uh, of renal denervation? Yeah, I, I think that was uh, when I first heard about this technology, I, I was initially quite skeptical because putting a catheter uh, into a vessel and uh, da deliberately damaging from the intimate out the adventitia didn't seem logical to me. But I think we've been surprised at the lack of acute uh, technical complications. There have been reports of, the, uh, of an occasional dissection of the renal artery, which is a natural consequence of guide intubation and inserting a catheter, but that's been remarkably few. The concerns that some people are expressing that many of us have are the risk of a restenotic phenomenon down the line, so response to injury, uh, six, nine, 12, or longer uh, time period after, after denervation. In the early studies, 
That doesn't, there doesn't seem to be a major signal for significant restenosis, but I think time will tell. So the enthusiasm for this technology is not limited to hypertension. Tell us where, what other directions is the field going in? Yeah, I think that's probably, if anything, the most exciting aspect of renal denervation. So this concept of chronic sympathetic nerve discharge from the brain being a principal pathophysiologic contributor to a number of disease processes um, lends, denervation, lends the possibility that denervation can treat multiple diseases. And there are small studies and sub-studies that suggest that renal denervation will reduce recurrence of AFib after pulmonary vein isolation will improve glucose tolerance, uh, will reduce sleep apnea, and may even modulate uh, heart failure. These are just some of the things that have been looked at. And I think we should stress that these have been small studies, um, not well controlled, but certainly have raised uh, eyebrows uh, across the spectrum of preventative cardiology as maybe a paradigm shifting technology. So if you had to, if you got at your crystal ball and tried to predict where we would be 10 to 15 years from now, what would you predict the role of denervation might be in clinical medicine? Yeah, I guess there's a spectrum of possibilities. So this could fail. If the Simplicity 3 study shows no effect or raises a signal for major harm, we, we could be stopping this in the very near term. Uh, that seems unlikely. More likely this will find, find a role that may be not as extensive as we're all hoping for, but, but, but significant nonetheless. I think. Um, recognizing that most people don't want to take hypertensive medications. Those that do are quite often beset by uh, side effects. So there may well be a role for this in, in patients who don't want to, can't take, or who can't take medication. Uh, those with metabolic syndrome and hypertension who are at highest risk of cardiovascular endpoints may benefit the most from denervation, which seems to address a number of the, the problems in, in that disease process. I think the technology will improve considerably. I have no doubt about it. Right now, it's a transfemoral six or eight French device. I'm sure that people are looking at getting a transradial device that you can imagine, you can envisage uh, a small cath lab or fluoroscopy suite where people come in having a procedure within uh, 15, 20 minutes transradially and then go home the same day. So there's a potential for this to be a relatively low risk, high frequency procedure. And given the breadth and depth of the market, there's been a lot of competing technologies that have been developed. Are there, is the, are there opportunities for further development or do you see that they're gonna have the same challenges as the current devices? Yeah, I, I don't know is the short answer. There are, I think at the last count, 55 registered companies with some technology in this field, so there's considerable impetus and excitement behind it. Um, some of the challenges will remain. Um, this is still an invasive procedure. Um, there's this still a concern about re-innovation mm. three, five years down the line. I have to say the early studies haven't uh, raised that as a, as a serious concern, but these things are going to be challenges that will need to be addressed. Thanks, Rajiv, for a very interesting discussion, a very exciting field. It may, in fact, someday change the way we practice medicine. Thanks, Rob. And thanks to our viewers for being with us today on this video podcast for the heart.org from the Division of Cardiovascular Diseases. We look forward to seeing you in the future.